Well, hello again. It's um, our first show of the weekend, last show of January, and I've been looking forward to this one for some time. It's a, a wonderful guest, Tim Cook, who wrote the the stand my standout book of last year, along with Alan Allport's Britain at Bay, uh, The Fight for History. Um, Tim is a prolific World War One and World War Two historian, but this book isn't so much about the history as about how the history has been told. So the history of the history in a strange way. So, um, well, well, welcome to the show, Tim. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, and thanks for that introduction. I'm here in Ottawa, where it's very cold today. I think it's about minus twenty-seven with the windshield, but oh, we're wow. hoping it warms up in a little bit. Yeah. Oh dear, I couldn't, I, I couldn't do, I, cope with that. When <laughs> I was younger, I used to not be able to cope with the heat, and I didn't, I didn't mind the cold. As I'm getting older, it's, it's, it's switching around. But yeah. anyway, your book. I mean, it's as I said in the in the in the top of the show there, one of two standout books. And as I said before, we went live to the folks watching. It filled in gaps in my knowledge that I didn't know I had those gaps. I mean, I, as a Brit living in Europe, you know, in France, I, I kind of knew that Canada, well, I knew Canada had changed its flag. I knew it had various museums. I knew these stages had happened, but I didn't always know the argy bargy in the getting of these things uh, through. So you you started off writing about the Great War, then World War II, and you've covered the battles, you've covered the campaigns and the leadership and things like that. This book isn't that kind of book. What, what prompted you to want to do this book? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, it's my 13th book, and I'm very lucky to be the director of research at the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. So, you know, it's not like I, I didn't know how World War II ended. Um, and I had written two previous books on Canada's involvement in the Second World War, The Necessary War and Fight to the Finish. Those were back-to-back -back books, big books, 500-page uh, books. They came out in 2014 and 15, back before when we could still do book travels and, and see people. And I often travel the country and, and speak at legions or bookstores or to the media. It's always very rewarding for me to, to meet veterans or now increasingly, as you would know, the children of veterans. And, and these are the powerful eyewitnesses to history uh, or their children who, are, who carry forward these stories. And as I was traveling with those two books, Paul, uh, people said two things to me. One, you know, thank you for writing these. I, I'd never read a lot of Canadian history. These are people who'd read history, but they were interested in American history or British history, or of course, German history, the war on the Eastern Front, the war in the Pacific. And they said, you know, I, I, I didn't really have a sense that Canada had played much of a role in the Second World War. Uh, and so that that kind of left me um, a little hollow inside because I've devoted about 25 years of my life, my adult life, to telling these stories, to, sh to, to really talking about Canada's contribution in the two world wars, two epic contributions, I argue. And I thought, isn't it strange that Canadians didn't know more about the history? So, so this book sort of emerged from that. I didn't plan to write a three volume history. But five years later, th this third volume has come out. And as you say, it's less about the war, which I've written about, which other people have written about. And it's more about the memory. The, why did we talk about the war the way we did? Why didn't Canadians do a better job in um, telling their history? Why hadn't we built the same memorials? Why didn't we build museums? In effect, why did we largely leave the war behind in 1945, when about a million Canadian veterans came home. That was the driving question to this book. And as you explore in the book, there isn't a single answer to that question. I mean, that there, there are lots of answers to it, all of which lead down potential rabbit holes, all of which you explore in the book. They're chapter by chapter. It's laid out very well, and you go through these phrases. And I have to say, you know, I went into it with, with, with a lot of naivety because I'm I'm living well I'm about 25 minutes drive away from Juneau Beach so I see this celebration of Canada's role in World War II and I go to Holland a lot Netherlands so I see this obsession I mean I have my Dutch friends in the Netherlands who come on and do shows with me people like Joris and Edwin and we're doing a show about Operation Veritable next week um, it's difficult for me to appreciate that there isn't this universal appreciation of the, of the, of the Canadians because I, I, I'm living in this world where it's so, so big. And of the 150 tour guides in Normandy, ask any one of them, they love the Canadian sector. They love that. They love the directness of it. You're going in one direction. The monuments are good, the, although most of them are, are French monuments. And so it was like re revelation reading the book going, but they didn't they didn't tell their own story. So, yeah. you know, as you 
let's go through some of the scandals first. I don't want to kind of um, stick on them too long, but there's been some various things. There was the, the flag. There was how you treated the Jewish veterans, the Inuit veterans, uh, um, uh, black, th that you cover those things there. That, yeah. I'm guessing, was some of the stuff when you were researching. You were quite a surprise at yourself. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, Paul, you know, you're exactly right. And uh, just to go back to your comment, I think it's a great one that today, of course, we have done a better job in Canada. And this is a book that, um, you know, the arc is 75 years, so it really starts in 1945. And 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 quite strangely, um, we didn't do a good job in telling our story. And that's really where I started. And, and I tried to, well, why is that? Because I, I thought about the Great War. And, and of course, in Canada, the Great War is really a defining event, an event where Canada was forever changed. I wrote a book on Vimy in 2017. I was at Vimy with CBC, our national broadcaster. I was the on-air historian. 25,000 Canadians made the trip to Vimy. Um, it, it was astonishing. It was incredible to be a part of that. And I remember thinking, why haven't we done this for the Second World War, where Canada had 1.1 million Canadians serving in uniform. That's from a country of 11 million. So one in 10 Canadians fighting around the world in multiple land campaigns uh, at sea, in the air. Why had we let this history wither away? And one of the things was that when the veterans came back, we treated them very well. I mean, Canada emerged from the war bloodied and bruised, but with 45,000 killed, but in comparison to Britain or France or, or Germany or Russia, of course, those were quite small numbers. And and we were a relatively wealthy country. The war propelled us forward into the prosperous uh, second half of the 20th century. The first half, Canada is poor, destitute. The depression was absolutely devastating. And so we treated our veterans well, and we were moving forward. And that was really kind of the first step is that we we weren't dwelling on the war. The million veterans were turned back to their communities. They began to build up the country. We had a stronger social security net. I mean, all this is fascinating, but it's not a lot of military history, right? For a guy like me who likes to walk the battlefields, who, who really is a battle historian, this was taking me into new places. Um, but it also took me to places like uh, memorials. And, and there was a fantastic debate in Canada, which very few people, I had written about briefly in my previous books, but I was able to really dig into it, where the World War II veterans came back and they said, we accept Remembrance Day. That has been established. We accept the poppy. We, um, you know, their fathers and uncles were in the, the, the Canadian Legion. Um, but what they wanted was a new national memorial in downtown Ottawa. We had a, a memorial from uh, erected in 1939, but it's, it's very much a First World War memorial. 22 figures are passing through the arch. It's in downtown Ottawa. It's a site where our National Remembrance Day is held to this day. But the World War II veterans said, you know, we're okay with the poppy and Remembrance Day, but give us a new memorial. This one clearly is to the First World War. And, and I talk about that debate, and, and you'll remember from the book, the government of the day just couldn't understand it and said, no, we're not going to build you this new memorial. And I argue there that without a national memorial, and again, overseas, of course, Vimy was unveiled in 1936, but there was nothing at Juneau Beach in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It's astonishing. Nothing at Dieppe other than a few plaques. And so the failure to memorialize, I argue, was really one of those first steps in, in allowing the memory to wither away. Yeah, and I think it seems as well, it's sometimes when I read a military history, and I, know, I appreciate yours isn't a military history, it's keeping a track of all the characters, and that's Sergeant Smith, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Jones. With, I was a little bit struggling to keep a track of all the committees and the organizations, <laughs> because you were very, and I'm going to be a really cliched, and, you know, you were very nice about it. So there's lots of groups that wanted things, and they, their, what they wanted didn't quite dovetail they all wanted it in a slightly dif different thing and so therefore it kind of became this motion against motion for meeting meeting a cabinet gets involved government gets involved canadian legion gets involved and and years pass with with these you know kind of bureaus looking at things and i was having to look up in index every now and now so that's the, <laughs> that's all about that organization and then they you know, the Veterans Association. So that 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 nicety almost was a problem. And, you know, being as a Brit, you know, my family were involved. We couldn't leave World War Two behind because no. our cities are ruined for a start. You know, we've got to rebuild them. We're on rationing for another 15 years. Um, the, the, we, you can't. The, the, the evidence of World War Two is all around you. And the same applies to France, the Netherlands. They've got to rebuild. Canada, being more, more um, 
uh, industrial and you'd got yourselves going, you were able to, yeah. as you said there, move on from the, the nastiness of the war quite quickly, give your veterans better jobs, better prospects. Yeah. And therefore, at the same time, I guess World War II kind of got pushed out, Pat, pushed out of the way a bit. But yeah, um, it did, Paul. And I, and I think you're right. Uh, you know, the title of the books, ma these matter, right? And the fight for history, the fight for history implies that there are these different groups contesting the memory of the war, fighting against one another for certain types of memorial and the state deciding that it doesn't want to be involved and, and really sometimes unintentionally pushing veterans forward into the prosperous. I mean, I think if you'd asked a veteran in 1946, do you want a job or do you want a memorial? They say, I want a job. Right. And so we need to understand that. And so I think you put it really nicely at the beginning. There isn't one culprit here. There isn't a bad guy in my book. It's there's a whole series of trends in not telling our our history. One of them is the Cold War that Canada emerges like the rest of the Western eyes right into the Cold War. And there's this incredible trial I talk about of Kurt Meyer in the book, and some of your, your watchers will know Kurt Meyer, uh, commander of the 12th SS, which was really fighting a almost a personal war with the, the Canadians in Normandy, 1st, 3rd Canadian Division, later the, the Canadian Corps. Um, and um, it was later found, of course, that those uh, the Hitler Youth, the 12th SS, had uh, executed uh, 156 Canadians and buried them in various parts of Normandy. And this was found as the Canadians advanced through Normandy. And they were uh, they wanted revenge and they took out revenge at the sharp end, but they also tried Kurt Meyer after the war. And I go through this trial and it's really staggering where Kurt Meyer is uh, clearly guilty of this and they find him guilty and they, they give him the death sentence. This is late, this is December, 1945, early 46. And then through uh, very strange procedural issues, his death sen sentence is commuted and he gets sent to Canada in New Brunswick of all places on, on the East Coast. And he's there for um, the better part of a decade before he gets sent back to Germany. And that's all part of the Cold War politics. And there was a, a real debate around that, right? Like we are turning our backs on Canadians. Uh, what about the 156 murdered Canadians? And, and eventually they send Kurt Meyer back and he's released. And it's those kinds of incidents that when you begin to look at them separately, they mean one thing. But when you put them together into a narrative, the failure to build memorials, um, the Cold War, Kurt Meyer, the fact that Canadians, we didn't really produce any television shows or movies. Now, we know, Paul, the impact of a Saving Private Ryan or anything like that, I'm sure when you do your tours, you know, you can see that people who have seen the films, they want to go to those spots or something around that because it shapes memory. I would love it to think that it's my books that are shaping the memory, but no, I mean, it's a film. It's, it's um, sometimes it's a podcast. Uh, when I lecture, you know, uh, when I wrote about the Vimy book, the most common thing I, I would get from people is, tell me about how Hitler said that he would never blow up the Vimy Memorial. I say, well, that's just, it's not true. It, there's no evidence of that. It just, there was no reason to blow it up. He blew up other memorials from the Great War and Vimy was damaged and Hitler visited the Vimy Memorial. I mean, and so all these conflating memories come together. Uh, and the same is for the Second World War. And, and so by the 60s and 70s, when there's a new generation, and as you say, in Britain, you couldn't leave behind the war. It, you were still living it. The, the dark legacy continued, the same for the French, the same for the, the Dutch, especially. Uh, and, and of course, Canada and the, and the Netherlands has a very close relationship that we can talk about later. But mm. by the 60s and 70s, that next generation, because we hadn't done the hard work in Canada of keeping the memory alive, it was largely forgotten. And, and that, to me, is quite shocking that we would have allowed our history to to fade away and, and the fight for history that the title is both about all the groups fighting, but also the fight against apathy. And that is something we all have to fight against. And quite clearly for about 50 years, um, we buried our history. Yeah, and that, you know, we always talk about the fact the only reference to the, uh, the Canadian involvement in the longest day, for example, is the caption that passes for about three seconds and a, and a passing mention of Juno Beach and everything else is American soldiers being very earnest and brave, British soldiers having comedy moments. And, 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 and yet at the same time, we can't blame Hollywood for going that direction because there wasn't the, uh, there wasn't the back catalog of Canadian films that could have influenced the filmmakers and the writers and the books and yeah. things. So it's, uh, it's a, it's a, 
it's a two two way street. The blame is both ways. And when Brits say, oh, "Well, Seven Pryor Ryan doesn't cover the Brits," well, we should make our own film then. But why don't we yeah. do Tommy Atkins on Sword Beats if we want yeah. to tell our story? Yeah. And you know, I was as I, when you each time you mentioned war films, because I'm a bit of a war film fan. I was thinking, well, it must be other ones. There must. I was looking at my list. No, no, he's right. There isn't. You know, I mean, a, a film I always talk about is a TV film, Lifeline to Victory, about the Canadian um, escorts and the Merchant Navy. It's not even available on DVD. I've got a ropey copy I recorded off the BBC about twenty years on video that I've converted to a, to a, to a, on to disc. But it's a cracking film, filmed on the 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 surviving ship, isn't it? The one that's the museum. Um, the what's it? Uh, yeah, uh, Sackville, is uh, it? No. Yeah. Anyway. The, um... Oh, the name will come to me. Sorry. But, yeah, but you're, but, you're exactly right that we haven't. And that was part of the book. We haven't done a good job in in telling these stories. And I, you know, Paul, I'm I'm with you. Like I'm not holding Steven Spielberg accountable for not telling the Canadian history story. That's nonsense. That's just that's not how Hollywood works. That wasn't what Spielberg wanted to do. Um, Band of Brothers, terrific. When I used to teach at uh, Carleton University here in Ottawa, I'd always have young people say, I've, I've watched Band of Brothers. It really affected me. That's how I first learned. Can you tell me, Professor Cook, about what's the Canadian one? Right. Uh, and I'd have to say, well, well, there isn't one. Oh, OK. Well, what about a Canadian film? You know, what, what film? Show? Well, there isn't one. Oh, OK. What about is there a great British film? It talks. Well, not really. And then. Then you get into debates like, uh, you know, The Great Escape, uh, fabulous film. We've all seen it and we all love it. Um, you know, there were Canadians involved in The Great Escape. Uh, Wally uh, Floody, who was a Canadian airman who was involved in digging the tunnels, he gets largely written. I mean, all the Canadians get written out of that film. Again, uh, it, it's a fine line. And I think as you're exactly right, in Canada, as I write in the book, I say it's a self-inflicted wound. I don't for one second think that Canadians can pull together a Steven Spielberg-like film, but we never tried. We never hmm. made the effort. We, we haven't even done large-scale documentaries, which is another great way for people to engage with history, even more so now. One of the oh, fascinating... We'll touch on documentaries later, and the ones you have done, I mean, I'm not bring up the valor and the horror, yep. ended up causing as many problems as they did They did benefits. And yeah. and and I also want to mention at this point, you kind of got your foot stuck in the man trap that was Dieppe as well, didn't you? Not you personally, Canada, you know, you got yeah. stuck in this obsessional interest in what was your greatest defeat. Well, Hong Kong, I guess, is in there, but one of, you, one of your greatest defeats in World War II, and only more recently with the work by people like David O'Keefe and things like that, has Dieppe kind of been reanalyzed but you go you get stuck on that one for a long time where it it's all about blaming and you you, you blame yourselves you blame Mountbatten you blame everybody else and it gets yeah. I think it just sort of breeds negativity and you know why why bother to read war books if they're just going on about how bad we were and how terrible it was and how awful it was and how terrible the suffering was and of course you need those kind of books but you do need the the kind of band of brothers type of books to show what units did well how they progressed the bond the men had and what they achieved at the end of it how they you know band of brothers both the series and the show is on the, in the book have that wonderful bit of the of the kind of the why that why we why we fight the best episode in my opinion written by john orloff of you know mate of mine and 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 everybody watched that understood what it was for they went through that war for that purpose yeah. if you get stuck in dieppe you 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 kind of don't see that, that that there was a victory at the end of it. Canada yeah. had helped bring freedom to the world, yeah. and so it, you're right, it, Paul. You're right, and it, it it's the bizarre arc that I write about in the book. By you know, by the '60s and '70s, we had we had failed to build the memorials. We hadn't built hadn't created the television shows. We hadn't written the books. There's no great novel, Canadian novel, uh, for instance, about the Second World War. We didn't have the same fil uh, films or plays. Um, and, and it continues. I mean, we weren't teaching it in schools. Now, some of that is the changing nature of the 1960s with the rise of youth culture. And in the second part of the decade, the, the anti-war movement in Canada that echoes what's happening in the United States with the Vietnam War. Um, but by 1968, and you'll remember that in the book, that, you know, there they're talking about canceling Remembrance Day in Canada. It simply does not resonate. Um, I talk about this in, in various ways, but one of the national newspapers say it's a day of irrelevance. And that was, that's hard to think about, you know, for me, Remembrance Day is so, such a powerful day for me to reflect upon 
my grandfather who served in the Second World War, or all those veterans I've met in my life, or just the role that Canada played, as you say, in, in a war that had to be won, as I call it, the necessary war in my first book. Um, and, and we weren't teaching it in our schools either. And I, I write about that in the book, our failure to teach our history until by the 70s and 80s, what Canadians knew about the Second World War was largely through the lens of defeat. Because the one thing we did talk about, as you say, was Dieppe. Now, why that is, is very strange. If you think of Canada and the First World War, the central battle is Vimy. April 1917, the, the four divisions attacking together for the first time. It's a story of, of, of perseverance and, and preparation and, and taking a ridge that others had not been able to capture. And it's a real nation building event. That's where we built our memorial. And yet for the Second World War, we chose a defeat. It was Dieppe. Uh, one day, the 19th of August, 1942, a clear-cut defeat. And I explore in the book why it seems to have resonated with Canadians. And there's an element there of blaming the British. They did us in, um, uh, which, of course, the Canadian commanders could have called off that operation at any time. There's the conspiracy element around Dieppe, where Montbatten had laid on the first raid. It gets cancelled. And then the second raid, the ultimate raid on the 19th of August, goes forward documentation was either not created or it was destroyed. And that has created a whole conspiracy theory around that battle. Um, and, you know, all nations choose battles, right? Is it is it the Battle of Britain or the Battle of the Atlantic or the fall of Singapore? And we know which ones are celebrated and talked about in Britain. Uh, and, and often nations do this, and I talk about this in the book, uh, about how nations use battles or campaigns or even wars, if you think of the Russians and the Great Patriotic War, to create national identity and myths and stories. And yet it fits within the narrative of my book when I talk about Dieppe. Why pick a defeat? Why, when combined with other things that are happening, and there was a major campaign in the 1980s in Canada for historical redress to Japanese Canadians. Japanese Canadians largely lived on our West Coast, about 23,000 when, when Canada is at war with Japan after Pearl Harbor and of course the fall of Hong Kong where 2,000 Canadians uh, were either killed or, or captured and then horribly treated and tortured in those prisoner of war camps. Um, the Canadian government of the day forcibly removed those Japanese Canadians, and it was driven by racist beliefs, but also fear. I mean, there was a great fear that Canada would be invaded. That was history that was largely forgotten until the 1980s when Japanese Canadians came together and, and made the case for a historical redress, a historical apology. And I write about that in the book, too, because that's a really prominent feature of Canadian history. And yet it clouded the larger war effort. We had 1.1 million Canadians serving. And by the 1980s, what we were teaching in our classrooms was um, the conscription crisis between English and French, the forced relocation of Japanese Canadians and other attacks on civil liberties, and the defeat of Dieppe. And that simply was not the extent of the Canadian war effort. Again, somehow turning this epic contribution in an utterly necessary war that had to be won, into a series of defeats and disgraces. And, and by the 1980s, I write in the book, the veterans were, were simply, um, they weren't furious, but they just could not understand why their history had been so badly diminished. Yeah, it seems to me the Canadians were just kind of going, all for that at that time, they're kind of going, yeah, they're just so disheartened by it all, the, the apathy, the disinterest. And I mean, the, 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 the defeat thing is fascinating because, of course, as, we, as a Brit, we had Dunkirk, which was also sure. a defeat. But yet somehow we managed to turn it into the phoenix out of Dunkirk is it drove forward both in our war, the propaganda and Churchill's, um, you know, Churchillisms and the, the building of a new army. And we use it and we still use it as a as a reference. The press annoyingly so sometimes with regards to the Brexit and this, that and the other. But we've managed to look at Dunkirk and see the symbolism of something beyond the defeat where it seems to me with the app and you explore this in the book you kind of got stuck going around in a circle right. about the defeat and like yeah but there's there's another message here you can pull out of it but no you keep going round and round and round examining the defeat to defeat to to, to no benefit and it's not yeah, just Paul, that it's you're exactly right i mean you're a better expert on this than i am but 
Dunkirk, the defeat has the redeeming qualities of sacrifice and the pluckiness of the ships moving in. But more importantly, it is it allows for the rest of the narrative of the war or, of course, the people who fought it to continue to move forward. And it's it's one of those ideas like being knocked to the ground, but then getting up again and keep moving forward. But you've nailed it. In Canada, we were knocked to the ground with Dieppe and then we just stopped telling the story. Uh, yeah. it, it's And so by the 1980s, uh, and I talk about this in the book, young people could rightly have been maybe forgiven for thinking that, one, Canada wasn't involved in World War II in any ways. And there's other stories I talk about here. The rise of the peacekeeping myth in Canada is a really important one that yeah. I talk about in the book, where when we did talk about our military history or martial history, it was through the lens of the peacekeeper because it allowed us in Canada, something that Canadians are quite proud of and, and fairly good at, um, to see themselves as a nation, a, a, a peaceable kingdom, a, a nation not of warriors, but of, of peacekeepers. Um, but it combined all those things. And by the 80s, Canadians, as I said, could be forgiven for thinking that we were somehow on the losing end of the war or that all we did was trample on the rights of Canadians um, in, in a draconian um, prosecution of a war that nobody at the time understood. I mean, all of it wrong, of course, but this is what happens when you don't teach your history. This is what happens when you don't have the films and the books and the memorials. And there's a real warning here. I mean, this book is resonating with Canadians. It's an, it, was, it is a national bestseller. People have written to me. People are talking about um, building um, a, a new memorial in Canada. People are talking about creating new documentaries because, of course, the last one, major one in Canada, the Valor and the Horror in 1992, was such a disaster. And, and so it, it's gratifying to see a, a book that is, I guess, um, resonating with people, but also maybe pushing some of them to action. Yeah, and I want to you know, mention the, the, your chapter titles um, because you, know, you don't pull your punches. You know, um, insulted, ignored, and marginalized. Um, you know, um, portraying ourselves continuously as losers. You know, you 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 really do highlight and and bring together these these elements to point out your Canada's failings. It's a strong word to use, failings, but there have been failings along the way. There have been this oversight and omissions, and and then and let's talk as it came up there. Let's talk about the valor and the horror because. We, we talk a lot about the power of my generation. I'm 52 next couple of months time um, of the world at war, you know, and so many historians from James Holland to Peter Caddick Adams to Philip Blood, I'm sure he's watching this today. It's those first opening lines of that. And down this, this road, the Germans came and it's Orador so glad and Laurence Olivier and the music then somehow you're just, boom, you're hooked and, that, and it stands up still however many decades on not perfect. We didn't know about Ultra and we made that, things like that. But it is, it's a still benchmark TV. It's kind of must have for anybody who studied it. And you said, you know, The Valor and the Horror in 1992. Now, I was aware of it because I'd seen the one episode that covers normally. I'd seen the one that covers Very Average. I hadn't seen the other episodes and I had, and I don't know how I came to get a copy of it. But that, that, was was heralded as being the kind of the big the big time to look at our past and and you said in yourself that you know it was a disaster explain explain what what happened yeah it is a disaster it's a disaster of, of history on film and we know the challenges of history on film although when it's done well we know it's absolutely brilliant as as you as you have just said and I've written about the valor and the horror before. It was a three-part series, um, two, each two-hour episodes, one on the, the fall of Hong Kong, so the defeat of the Canadians at Hong Kong and the, the harrowing experience of the prisoners of war, the second one on Bomber Command, and the third one on the Canadian defeat in Normandy at Verrier Ridge on the 25th of July, 1944. And, you know, what was so shocking about these films is that all three of those were, were portrayed in the film as a defeat or a disgrace in the terms of Bomber Command, which was not a defeat, although the, the historians or the filmmakers portrayed it as absolutely useless and something close to a war crime. Um, you know, you can only understand that, and I, I say this in the book, if you look at that full arc, and as we were just talking about, by the 1980s, the only thing Canadians knew about the war was defeat and disgrace, right? Japanese Canadian redress, um, civil liberties, conscription, and DF. And um, that maybe is boiling it down a bit, but I mean, I, I went through high school in the 80s and that's what we were taught. 
Um, nothing on the ballot the Atlantic, the 100,000 Canadians who play an absolutely crucial role in keeping Britain in the war. Nothing on um, the 100,000 Canadians who serve in the Italian campaign or, or, or the importance of the Italian campaign. Nothing on the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan where 131,000 airmen were trained up. Nothing on the clearing of the Scheldt, maybe the most important campaign by the Canadians. Nothing the fact that 1st Canadian Army under General Harry Criar commanded in 1945 430,000 soldiers, British, American, French, and others, right? And Canadians, of course, focused and boiled down to defeat and disgrace. And that's what the Valor and the Horror presented for Canadians. And it was a, it was a slick film. Um, it had new storytelling techniques, and it looked good, and, they, and it was seen by millions of Canadians. But the veterans just thought it was a travesty because it again focused on defeat and loss. And I write about the Bomber Command episodes where Canadian airmen were portrayed as either dupes, as in they didn't know what they were doing. And it was bloodthirsty figures like Bomber Harris who were hurling the naive, uh, slightly stupid, backward Canadian boys into these campaigns to kill German women. Uh, and children, and of course, there was a you know uh, not just the bomber veterans, but others who said, well, that's just nonsense. That's a that's a twisted reading of what the bombing campaign was. And then, really, to to think about it, the episode you saw on Verrier Ridge, why pick the one defeat without mentioning? And it it is literally in like 30, 40 seconds, you know, that the Canadians came ashore on D Day as one of the spearhead formations as they held off. The, the German uh, assaults, which Mark Milner has written about so effectively, and the slow grinding battles through Normandy um, and the defeat at Verrier Ridge. Of course, it was a defeat. But then the victories beyond that, and let alone the Shell campaign and those other campaigns. So it, it was in 1992, the absolute low point, I argue, of the narrative of defeat and disgrace where veterans really felt that uh, not only had Canadians forgotten about their contributions, but that they had been reduced to something close to war criminals. And you can understand how shocking that must have been. Um, and, and, and from that point forward, um, you know, veterans just, they realized they had to take the history in their own hands. They had to play a more active role in telling their story. And that's, that's the last part of my book, this idea of forgetting the war, but then also remaking it and returning to it and demanding that the history be told. And I'm not a historian. People will know my books, my 13 books. I'm not a sort of heroic historian, stand behind the flag, hand on your heart. There's a lot of awful things that happen in war. And I write about it from the soldier's perspective, those eyewitnesses to history, the, the brutality of combat. But I also point out that if ever there was a war that had to be fought and won, it was the Second World War. And, and, and how badly wrong the valor and the horror got it was shocking to, uh, uh, to those historians who understood the history, although most Canadians didn't know the history. And so this was their primary means to understand the war. And that's where it's disappointing. I mean, the, the dam busters get lots of recognition in Britain and, and people, of course, have discussed whether or not it was worth it and the flooding of the fields and killing of Germans. But you can still do that within the framework of honoring the pilots and honoring the crews. It's about nuance and balance and presenting information to an audience so they can take it all on board. We're not idiots. You can say, look, we can celebrate Guy Gibson. He was a bit of a bit of a, you know, dominatrix. And, you know, but we can celebrate what they did, even though we can also question its use. But just presenting Bomber Command and your book was, you know, I was outraged on behalf of by one, my cousin. I lost a cousin as a bomber, as a, as, an, as a pilot on a Lancaster in Germany. So yeah, to being, you know, um, although he was British, you know, accused of being a war criminal just riles me up, you know, and yeah. Shelt Estuary is interesting because I did an interview back last year with Alan de la Vita, who's the producer of this new Forgotten Battle, the film the Dutch have made yeah. about the Shelt Estuary with with um, Draco Malfoy from Harry Potter as the British glider pilot. Anyway, I asked him, what, why has why have you, a Dutch producer, made a film about the Canadians and Hollywood? Because they haven't done it themselves. I mean, it was there in kind of a damning underlying. He didn't mean it in any kind of critical way. And he, of course, the, the tragedy was he'd hoped to invite over, you know, like hundreds of Canadian veterans to, to have them there. And a the film came out in December, COVID, blah, blah, blah. But it's going to propel me to the point about how your book does have the kind of the, the, the rebirth. 
but yeah. some of that does come from Europe, doesn't it? And because a lot of my viewers are in the Netherlands and, the U and, and, and Normandy and what have you, you were pushed a little bit forwards by, by us in Europe, weren't you? Because the people of Normandy have loved you for years. The people yeah. of the Netherlands have loved you for years. So to, to, your book does break down this, this contrast between when a Canadian veteran was able to go to Nijmegen in 94 or 94 and treated like absolutely royalty. And he goes back and in between that, the Valor and the Horror comes out saying that the Canadian soldiers and airmen are criminals. It's, so explain a, a bit about how you Yeah, those anniversaries are were so crucial. And, and as we look back now, you'll remember that 1994 and 1995, first in France, and the Canadians were a part of that. And Canadian veterans went back by the thousands. They were in their early 70s at that point. The Valor and the Horror had come out in two years earlier in 92, really that low point. And, 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 and thousands of veterans returned. Um, and there was, there was more... Um, there was more advertising in Canada. Um, 1993 had seen quite a lot of commemoration around the naval wars and about the Atlantic, primarily the turning point, I guess. Um, and so 94 Canadian veterans went back and they were shocked because they were greeted as the liberators that they were, these aged warriors who had brought freedom. And here it was that the French were cheering and the British, of course, because they had stopped off in Britain beforehand, and what was really different was that Canadians, our two primary um, uh, television networks were there reporting live for days on end. This hadn't been done before. And uh, we now kind of know that that's kind of accepted, right? That there's gonna be those historical commentators. I've been, been that many times for our CBC, our national broadcast. It was new at the time. And so Canadians were watching this, these our Canadian veterans who we had forgotten about in our own country, being greeted as liberators. And the next year in 1995, um, thousands and thousands of Canadians went back and there were organized tours and the Dutch treated them like royalty. And there were crowds of 500,000 people in Appledorn to welcome the Canadian liberators. And the veterans came back saying, how can we be heroes in one country or in Europe and we come back to a country where we're nobodies. And I, I have interviewed veterans um, and they talk about a really seismic change in the feeling. And it's at that point where I argue that Canadians woke up, that we cast aside our apathy, this, um, this shroud of silence that had descended across the country. We clawed through it and we began to hear the veterans' voices. They began to write their memoirs. There were a number of bestsellers. There was a whole new generation of historians who began to write this. That's the time where I began to write in 1996, my, my first article. I was at the Royal Military College doing a master's degree. Um, so there's, we began to think about the ways we had failed, failed to tell our story. And I write in the book, as you know, about the creation of the Juno Beach Center. Um, which is a really a staggeringly important, I think, uh, ambassador, quiet ambassador on Juneau Beach. Up to that point, there was almost nothing there to signify that Canadians had landed and it fell to veterans. And I write about them in the book of how the veterans said, we can't wait for our government anymore, a government, successive governments that had ignored our history. And so veterans took it upon themselves. They raised millions of dollars. They built the Juno Beach Center, which is still there mm. and has increasingly, as you know, Paul, become a much more important place for Canadians to gather. And then just two years later, we built the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa, where I'm very lucky to work and, and was involved in that project from the beginning. So these, we've begun to build these important um, they're not memorials, although they have memorial qualities, but they are education centers too. And they, one of them in the heart of downtown Ottawa, the capital, and, and one on the beach where Canadians uh, bled and sacrificed. Um, and, and I argue in the book that we have done a better job. Although sadly now we're, we're down to 22,000 uh, veterans. So they're all in their late 90s, mid to late 90s. And we're moving forward to that point where we will be we will lose them all. Uh, and I think um, now is the time, uh, I guess it's a call to action in my book, that we need to keep fighting for our history. And as we lose our veterans, we need to keep fighting. Otherwise, uh, 25, 30 years from now, some other person may write a book and uh, boy, Tim Cook's book was interesting how it was the, the, the drop and nobody cared and then the rise and then a drop again, right? It, it yeah. doesn't mean that there's going to be a Whiggish curve where we keep telling our history. 
each generation has to fight for their history. Each generation has to tell their stories. It is incumbent upon us, I argue in the book, for Canadians to do a better job. Yeah, and it, it, your book, you know, it, it does have this a positive end. You know, it goes, it, it does go down a bit and it comes out a bit. It reminded me reading it as well of the Vietnam experience for the American because they they had the glory of World War II, treated their veterans, ticker tape parades in New York, the whole lot, blah, blah, GI Bill. And then the Vietnam experience was not the same. No. But they have healed themselves and have made themselves better since then to the point where usually the celebration of what veterans achieve can be kept out of politics. It doesn't matter whether you're left wing or right wing. You can ha you, It's quite OK in the USA now to have a, a veteran sticker and also an anti-government. You, you can oppose a war, but celebrate the, vet the veterans. So that they are now at a better place now, I think, because of that roller coaster. And I think yes. from my point of view, Canada is now at a better place now because it got so bad. The only way was up. And so yeah. it's it's it, 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 that, that will continue. And I was in Nijmegen in '95. I was in I I was part of that big parade of the veterans. There was a thing at a lot of football stadiums in Nijmegen. I was a reenactor. So it was just as uh, Essex Regiment, 49th Division, and there were some Canadian reenactors there. And we were like an hour and a half late getting to the stadium because the crowds in the streets. And I remember a Dutch person saying it wasn't like that when the net Holland got to the uh, semi cup of the uh, semi final of the world cup oh. in 74 with Johan Cruyff, whichever year it was. Yeah. And that that's the two occasions when the streets were that busy Canadian yeah. veterans coming back and football. And you think that's yeah. it in a nutshell. Yeah. So no, it was a, a staggering, a staggering event. And you're, you're right. Uh, in, in thinking about Vietnam and world war two and, Every war has that. It has its own unique contours of memory around it. And of course, most, most battles, campaigns, they get left behind, right? As we move forward, people like us are a little different. We read it, we live it, we breathe it. I think there's always a strong element for the families, the, the descendants, the children to know their history, but not always. I mean, I often encounter people who are in their 60s or 70s saying, my dad was a veteran, but I have no idea what he did. Can you help me research? And I'm sure you have the same. Mm. Um, so I guess the question is, or the statement is that every war is different. Um, and the way we remember them is different. And it changes over time. And that's a kind of complex way to say that our history is always evolving and changing and mutating and taking on new meaning and losing meaning and being used and abused and um, all of those things. And I, I guess the key thing is that it takes champions. That's one thing I write about in the book at the end. It takes people to do the heavy lifting. It takes people to make the sacrifices. And often history work is... It is very rewarding to us and the people who read it, but it's not widely celebrated across a society. We live in a digital age. There's all kinds of things happening. It takes time for people to settle down and to, to read a history book or to engage with that in a way that is meaningful. But I would argue it's important. It's, it's who we are. It's who we were. In Canada, um, we had a strange, misplaced um, self-loathing for 50 years, I argue, um, things are better, but it gives you a sense that it is a fight, as the book suggests, the fight for history. It's a fight that continues. It's a fight that uh, doesn't end. Um, and it doesn't end with me, and it doesn't end with you, and it doesn't end with the next generation. We must keep moving forward to ensure that these important stories are not forgotten. Yeah, and I think to have to have a discussion about historiography, you have to have and have and have a, have a ugh, you have to have had enough time passed to be able to go back and study it. We couldn't have studied the historiography of World War Two twenty years after it. You needed to do it like seventy five years after it, so you could actually go back and trace these peaks and troughs and highs and lows and things. And you know, in Britain, we have this this issue with the kind of the um, the symbolism of World War Two being used in you know the sort of the Brexit fight things like that, which is actually sort of sometimes self self harming in that we've we've built it up into something it wasn't the battle of britain is it need, is being 
we had this idea that it was we were alone against the world and the Luftwaffe. We were the underdogs, and the reality we now realise is we weren't the underdogs. We 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 should have won that. But we had a better system, better control. It had been built up for years and years. The Germans were stretching themselves, getting across the channel to us, and and we're but we're we're accepting that now. We're, and that's this period we're going through of looking back and going, okay, we used to look at these events this way. Now let's spin it around a bit and start looking at it a new way, um, and not forget the old way as well. So. When you were writing uh, this particular book, did you, uh, well, when you wrote it, you said you got letters from people. Did you get any hostility from people? Did you get anybody saying you shouldn't have kind of aired our dirty washing in, in public like that? No, uh, but I, I was wary that I was engaging with every single controversial event around the Second World War. I mean, I address Bomber Command. I write about it in the book that uh, a scholarship now reveals, of course, that Bomber Command it was, was important and effective in damaging the German war machine. It didn't win the war on its own, but no fighting service or arm did. I talk about the failures like the Dieppe, yeah, but also the successes. Um, I talk about the Hong Kong uh, Canadian veterans who have often felt abandoned by the state. Um, of course, they emerged from four years of captivity, brutality, malnutrition, um, uh, and execution, and they were treated terribly by the state. And I, I tell that story. I tell the Japanese Canadian redress story, which is probably the most controversial element in the book. I think I'm very fair to that story. I, I call it what it is. It was a reprehensible act, and yet it must be understood in the context of the time. And me, maybe more importantly, how redress campaigns can shape memory as this did from the 1980s. I talk about the failure of veterans to tell their own story in, in some cases, uh, acknowledging of course the challenges of what we would now call post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and that how veterans haven't always been on the right side of history. They fought against the adoption of a Canadian flag, for instance, from 1962 to 1965. So it's a complex history. And I think this is the role of the historian. We have to address the difficult elements of our history, even though my sympathy by default is with the veterans and those who have served and sacrificed. And I am always there to try to tell their story. But it is a controversial book. I think the, 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 the divide in Canada, and I know it is similar in Britain, is between public historians and academic historians. And if you'll just permit me a minute or two to explore that, I have a PhD in history, but I see myself as a public historian, which means to, to share our history with all Canadians. Uh, I used to play hockey and I'd be in a dressing room and I'd be around me would be plumbers and, and business guys and none of them would ever pick up a history book, but they had seen me on television, a documentary or something. And they, yeah, you look good last night, uh, Tim. Of course it was from five years before something rebroadcast. And it, it struck to me that Canadians want their history, but we, those who have spent their lives thinking about it or writing about it, we need to give it to them. We need to present that. And that very much shapes my perception of being a public historian at the Canadian War Museum, at a museum where we get about 600,000 visitors a year, or we did before COVID. And hopefully we will again on the other side. Mm. So it's important to me to tell these stories. It is less important, I think, in the universities. And we've seen for the last 20, 30, 40 years, a real sea change in Canada and especially Canadian history to embrace um, the marginalized, to embrace social theory, to embrace activist history. And, and while this is important because those are stories that need to be told, they have been done at the diminishment of national history, of military history, of diplomatic history and of business history. And we could keep going on. And so we have lost kind of the foundational spine of telling Canadian history. And that I talk about in the book, as you'll remember, Paul, that too contributed to the silencing of the Second World War. If you only look at the Second World War through the lens of how it was perhaps in certain cases an attack on civil liberties, that is a weird and twisted way to think about the Second World War. But if that's what's being taught to students, you can understand why they just don't know anything about the Second World War. Yeah. I mean, and, it's, it's, and then go, I'll go into more detail. Yeah. If you, you can do it in two ways. You, if you start to people saying the World War II was an era where people from all walks of life in Canada came together for a common good. You've got people's ears pricked up. They're interested. They're feeling nice and warm and fuzzy. And then you can introduce the fact, of course, of, there were, of course, casualties. How we treated the Japanese ancestry people was bad. And you lower them down a bit. But if you just start with a negativity, 
people start folding their arms and not wanting to listen and that's that that then means you're not getting you're not communicating and so i'm with you on that public history history thing um a public history as opposed to academic you know that you can get much more accomplished with a smile than you can with a frown can't you so you kind of build up say look this is what we're good at this is how we contributed and now let's analyze this slightly negative chapter as well along the way but just un you know I, I in my library I guess my first I didn't really grow up with that kind of CP Stacy kind of history. I was a bit I was a bit too young for that. So I kind of got that and I got a lot of British and European histories. But I did go back and read those ones where it's unrelentingly our commanders are bad, unrelenting our vehicles are bad, our troops are bad. The Germans are, are brilliant, by the way. That's what those books also said. The Max Hastings, I know he's British, you know, the Germans were impressive, the Germans were efficient. They go, oh, come on, we beat them. We we yeah. resoundingly <laughs> built them, beat them. Everywhere we fought them, we beat them so let, none of this they were brilliant because yeah. we defeated them anyway um so what where you know you say we're in a better era now so what what yeah. steps can be taken now i mean i think globally things like zoom things like twitter and social media that's i think where we share things together but what what would be the, the your hopes for the next generation if someone is writing a new book about historiography and they're citing your book in 20 years time what would you think what would you like to have been the lessons learned in the next say 20 years yeah it's a good question paul and i suppose in the next 20 years we will have lost lost all of our second world war veterans uh, that that we can be certain of and i wonder what that means to how we think about the war when we have no eyewitnesses left to who served in uniform. There will still be young people who survived the Blitz or, or maybe in Canada who, who uh, remember a father who served. Uh, I think that's important, right? That next generation and, and how we talk about their history. Um, so where do we go forward? Well, in Canada, um, over the last 25 years, historians like Terry Kopp and Mark Milner and Alec Douglas and Jack Granitstein have all pushed the historiography in, in new directions. And I think we have a much better sense of the Canadian uh, military effort. And we've begun to explore more on the home front as well and how Canada was shaped by that war. I think we will continue, and I would encourage this, uh, although it's an area of my own scholarship, to think about how war shapes us. What are the legacies of war, good and bad? Um, those dark episodes and those that propelled us forward. In Canada, we can, we can definitively look at the Second World War, the massive mobilization of Canadians and the state, and see how a new country emerged from that, a wealthier country, a country that moved forward into uh, the prosperous second half of the 20, 20th century. Wouldn't it be bizarre if we returned back to not teaching about the Second World War? I mean, putting aside battles and campaigns and putting aside the stress and strain of those who served and fought in a war that had to be won, to simply not understand the Second World War effort writ large is to gut a considerable part of Canadian history. So I hope that the Second World War will not, will not return to some deep trough, as you said, some deep silencing. Um, we have to keep moving forward. And I see, hopefully I'm gonna keep writing books, so I will continue to tell these stories. Um, the War Museum is an absolutely crucial place. Juno Beach Center is crucial. I, I do hope that Canada, uh, and, and Canadians find a way to do and to present a, a really important multi-series um, television show. Because I think that, or film, is a way to reach the next generation. Um, that's absolutely crucial. And every country is doing it. Uh, and it is strange when it has to be the Dutch to tell the Canadian story, to choose one example there. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's where it coming together is. I mean, I was, did a show about the Go For Broke film about the Japanese Americans. Of course, you've got a Canadian Japanese actor, Peter Shinkoda, who was in all sorts of things, The Man in High Castle. When he did the film about the, the Japanese in Hawaii, he then looked into his history of the, of the Japanese in Canada. And, and, and as you in, covered in the book, he unearthed this this bad past but he's he's got you know he's got clout he's got reach he's a he's a hollywood actor he, he's the kind of person who could be brought forward and said you know push forward the idea of this and and i, I did i want to before we end the show i wanted to um say that for those who get the book and absolutely the links went below and please get it it's just it's just really good in a kind of a good like mini series you all the all the plot lines do get resolved 
you know, the Hong Kong veterans do get the apology. The Bomber Command do kind of get their museum and their features. The Merchant Navy, who kind of got pushed out, do get welcomed back it back in. So you, it's not that you bring them together. It's not fiction. It was it was it's a factual book. But you do bring all these threads together, and you there is this resolution. When when you close that cover, you feel well it, it has it has corrected itself uh canada and due to these the, the important work by lots of these uh, these groups that were perhaps pulling in different directions did eventually through whatever come together and start pulling in the same direction so you you are definitely as a country in a much better place now than you were in that low point of 92 when the ballon horror came out and maybe now it's time to show that documentary again and say now look where we've come look look how look how we were rooted there and now look where we've come or, or, or use extracts from it in a new film. Yeah. And say, look, this, I, I this hope that work. someone will yeah. do that. Um, either, either our national broadcaster, the CBC or, or a private company. I think Canadians want their history. I think um, British and French and Americans, we all want our history. It grounds us uh, perhaps in this globalized world where so much is common and shared. It's maybe it's only our history that is our own. Of course, it's a history that cannot be told only through the national lens. It has to be, I mean, you simply can't tell the Canadian Second World War story without telling the British story, right? And, and others. And yet, um, as I have often said in my talks and lectures, and I do in this book, let's not expect other countries to tell our history. It's up yeah. to us. We're a mature nation. We have to do the heavy lifting because yeah. if you don't, don't expect others to do it for you. And I think that's a lesson that is resonating. And so those, to come back to your earlier question, those letters that I'm getting and emails from people, people saying a, a, a number of things, thanks for writing this, thanks for alerting to me this, uh, to these complex stories, all of those strands of memory and different groups coming together, but also people saying, what are we gonna do? Uh, how, how are we gonna move this forward? How do we ensure to use, you know, John McRae's torch of remembrance, it's passed to the next generation. And I think that's an important debate. I don't have all the answers. Uh, there are a lot of smart people, a lot of dedicated people in Canada who can work together to think about this. But I'm, I'm really pleased that people are talking about it. And then I guess as a historian that I have, I have created a foundation for everyone to stand on in some degrees, and then to think about moving forward, right? We're, before this, there was no book like this. There's never been a book written like this. There, there aren't many books written like this in the U.S. or in Britain either. We were talking about that before the show. Yeah, um, I, I wish there was. I mean, I, and um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's it, it, the only way to move forward is to kind of heal the scars of the past and say, okay, underline them all, look at them all, analyze them, and say, okay, what have we learned? Now let's take it forward. And that's exactly what your book does. It, it, it's a, it's a step towards uh, a better understanding of our history, a better telling of our history, uh, our meaning collectively in the world. So, well, you know, we said we'd do about 45 minutes now. It's, it's up to an hour. It's, you've got a Sunday Diamond. morning, a Sunday lunch ahead of you. I've I've enjoyed talking to you, Tim. I knew it would be a good day. And um, I'll have you back on again and we'll talk about something else. But in, in terms of um, World War II TV, we've got a little quiet week ahead. I'm going to do a few of those conflicts on camera shows. We've got Wednesday, got Robin Hutton coming on talking about uh, war animals. Wonderful book she wrote about all the, including a cat, a cat that was in World War II. You, 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 you couldn't make it up. And then lots more stuff coming up all through February. We've got Iwo Jima week. We've got uh, um, uh, a Great Escape week in March. We've got Poles at War. We've got a whole range of shows coming your way so as usual don't forget to like the video subscribe to videos check us out on patreon check the links to tim's book check the link links to uh, other books we've talked about and 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 we'll we'll see you all again very shortly so thank you very much tim for joining us uh did you enjoy it i loved it thanks paul it was a great conversation uh terrific questions and uh thanks to everyone who's watching thank you so i'll see you all again on world war ii tv this is paul Woodat and tim cook saying see you again thanks have a good weekend Bye bye